why we worship the way we do. It helps to set the foundation for the church. Absolutely. That's, that's and how we worship, what we worship, why we worship. And uh, we should know all of those things. Uh, to be able to share it with others. We do. Okay. Um, and VBS uh, is the next big announcement. Please pay attention to everything that's in the vestibule and uh, get that word out. If you can help through gift cards or Amazon, I saw with grass. Please do that. Any other announcements at this time? Okay, we have an extensive uh, prayer list. All these people are in continual need of prayer as well as their family members. So, um, Art Bush, Jerry Timbrook, Mitch Seagroves, J.D. Seagroves, Darian Stabley, Juan Markley, Mike Wood, Nancy Ames, Brooklyn Ewell, and in addition is Betty Teets Hutzler. Uh, she's in the hospital with some condition. If you have any others, please just put them on the tab that Brenda supplies for you in the bulletin, and we'll get those on our prayer list. If I could mention, Lester, is, Lester, is it okay to mention, Lester's going to be going to UVA uh, for a specialist, so all of you praying for him as he goes there. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Can I add a guy named Don Thomas? Uh, he had a seizure at work uh, on Friday.
This is 
again. I'm sure when I just said that, you all heard those words that you could immediately complete that thought. God created the heaven and the earth, light, land, waters, life. A world full of fruits of God's creativity. A man was made, a woman formed, and a man given care for the garden. Then things went sideways. The serpent showed up, challenged the very words of God. The serpent planted confusion, Greek disobedience. We covered some of that today in Sunday school. <coughs> the first people ended up in exile, cut off from their creator. We read Genesis and wonder how things went off track so quickly. If they had it all, what was their problem, right? Free food, free rent. All the utilities included, FaceTime with God. Adam and Eve had it all, and they trashed it. Surely we would have done better had we been in their place. Mm. But really, would we? When we hear the words do this, we can immediately complete the thought in remembrance of me. And twice on the night Jesus was betrayed, handed over for crucifixion, he instructed his disciples, and us for that matter, to remember him by eating the bread and drinking the wine. Jesus' actions would be once and for all, one and done. But why are our actions of remembrance repeated into the future until he returns? Because Jesus, Jesus knew and we were no better than Adam and Eve. We we're just as gullible, just as prone to get off track, and just as needy as they were. It's often suggested that we examine our hearts of communion. And Paul advised in 1 Corinthians 11 28 that a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Quick, take a quick look at ourselves. See what sin lies in there. Maybe we spoke harshly to our spouse, child, or friend. Guilty. Maybe we lied to our boss. Perhaps we had a grudge against the neighbor. Or maybe we were pointlessly trying to hide something from God. Now is the time to repent and begin again. Confess failings to the Lord. Reconcile with those you have sinned against. Come to the table where Jesus waits to restore and heal you. Lord, I thank you for these sacrifices that you made for us. Jesus paid for the price for us sinners. Please forgive, forgive us if we have fallen short of your expectations, Lord. Through his body and blood, fresh starts are possible daily.
anyone? Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you that you are holy, holy, holy. Thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit. God, please open our hearts, God, to you and to your word. May our hearts, God, be the good soil. They're good food for you, God. Uh, may we all be good and faithful servants and help God win the lost, God, to you. And uh, Lord, we just uh, pray you please continue to watch over this church body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, today we talk about uh, continuing our series in Luke chapter 8. Uh, we talk about the testing, heeding God's word, testing. So, uh, we're going to review, though, first of all, how to grow in faith uh, from the first part of Luke chapter 8. So we need to go back. It's been a couple weeks. I covered something different last week, so we need to go back and review a little bit. So, uh, because, yeah, because it's been a couple weeks. So, uh, the first part of Luke chapter 8, in the first part of Luke chapter 8, Jesus spoke about the parable of people's hearts. Okay, it's really what it was truly about. It's called the parable of the sower, but it's really about the parable of people's hearts. And Jesus told us about everyone's spiritual heart will be one of those four categories. One of those four categories. Either the hard soil, that is completely resistant to the Word of God. Uh, two, the shallow soil. That's the emotional here that uh, doesn't establish deep roots. And when testing comes, the plant dies. Uh, the crowded soil. Uh, the crowded soil is the heart that refused to weed out uh, sin of their lives, and thus it choked out the Word of God. And then there was the last soil, the good soil. This represents the person with a good heart, a noble heart, and re they receive the word of God, and through perseverance over the course of a lifetime, uh, produce a good crop. Uh, we shared about how Jesus talked about a lamp, and that he placed it up high so that it would help other people to spiritually see. We shared about uh, there is nothing hidden that will not be exposed, that everyone needs to listen carefully to the word of God and apply it to our lives. Our Lord Jesus uh, also clearly taught in Luke chapter uh, 8, verse 18. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has, whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has will be taken from him. And this clearly shows us uh, that those who listen and are open to the gospel and obey the gospel, they will receive more of a spiritual blessing. But those that refuse to listen to the gospel and refuse to obey it, uh, even what they have will be taken away from them. We also saw the uh, interaction between Jesus and his physical family. How they came to see Jesus and uh, they said to Jesus, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are standing outside uh, wanting to see you. And Jesus used that opportunity to teach a very powerful lesson. He said this, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and put it into practice, Luke 8, 21. So if we have a humble, repentant, God-fearing, teachable heart, we know through the scriptures how to receive the word of God, and how also from the earlier part from Luke chapter 8, we know now how to grow in the faith. We listen to it. We obey it. We put it into practice. We put God's word into practice in our lives. Warren Wearsby writes this. Everybody lives by faith in something or someone. I thought about that at first. I was like, I don't know if I agree with that. You know? But then I first thought about it. I was like, I gotta think about this one. So he says, everybody lives by faith in something or someone. The difference between the Christian believer and the unsaved person is not that one has faith and one does not. They both have faith. The difference is the object they put their faith in. Or the person, most importantly, that we put our faith in. For faith is only as good as the object or the person that we put our faith in. Some people have faith in themselves. Some people have faith in good grades. Some people have faith in other humans. None of those faiths are saving faith. The Christian believer has to put his faith in Jesus Christ. And he bases that faith on God's Word, the Word of God. If he believes and repents and he obeys the gospel, that is the only type of saving faith for each of us today. Now, we're going to look at some tests. We'll be at the two of them today. Uh, but some tests that uh, 
were there, basically after they've been taught these things, now Jesus is going to test them. Jesus has been teaching and preaching about faith for a while now. Now Jesus is going, now Jesus is going to put his disciples through a series of tests uh, to test their faith and to see just how strong their faith is. Now I honestly, truly cannot help but think that God is doing the very same thing in this congregation today. And I think he randomly does so every now and then. He'll put us individually, but also as a group through test. Through test. The tests are different. But our faith and our obedience to God and his word are absolutely being tested. I want to strongly encourage you. Obey God. Obey God's word. Draw as closely to God as you possibly can. And pass the test. Now some background on this passage. Uh, by the time the Lord had finished giving these parables, the disciples must have felt like they were graduate students at this point in the school of faith. They now understood the mysteries that had been hidden for centuries. If from the scribes, from the tribes, from, from scribes, from the rabbis, from the, from the tribes, okay, even, even from Old Testament prophets, some, some of these mysteries had not been shown until the disciples came along when Jesus uh, told them what these things meant. What they did not realize is that faith must be tested before it can be trusted. Faith must be tested before it can be trusted. It's one thing to learn a new spiritual truth, right? It's one thing to learn a new spiritual truth, but it's something completely different to actually put that truth into practice in everyday life experience. Satan does not care about how much Bible truth we learn in our heads, so long as we don't put that truth into practice in our lives. That's what he doesn't want. He doesn't want the spiritual truth to be received in our hearts and put into practice. Truth that is only in the head is just academic. That's it. It's just academic. You can know lots of facts, but it's a purely academic knowledge. And never get into the heart unless it's practiced. Unless it is practiced by our will. Doing the will of God from the heart is what our Heavenly Father, Yahweh God, wants from each and every single one of us. I'm going to read that again. Doing the will of God from the heart is what our Heavenly Father, Yahweh God, wants from each and every one of us. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 6 proves this. He says this. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes are on you, but like slaves of Christ. What's the next part say? Doing the will of God from your heart. Satan knows that academic truth is not dangerous, but active truth is. Read that again. Satan knows that academic truth is not dangerous, but active truth is. Watch how the Lord Jesus meets the challenges of faith We'll cover two of them today. Jesus shows us the way to pass these tests. He shows us how to pass these tests. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and they set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall, that is a giant storm. We've had, thank you, we've had some rain here recently, Right? It was wonderful to have some rain. Thank God. Thank you, God, for the rain. Okay? But this is a giant storm that's now uh, on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke Jesus up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Now, Lord Jesus was weary from a long day of teaching and he wanted some sleep, needed some sleep. Je Jesus told them, uh, that he was going to the opposite shore. So in telling them, if we're going to go to the opposite shore, that should have been an encouragement to them. It should have strengthened them uh, to go through the storm. Mark Moore writes this. This is a very important narrative. It is the first time, it's the first time that Jesus' power acted on the inanimate. It brought fear and astonishment even to the closest of his followers. This event is more than a mere account of, his, of a historical event. This is a great miracle. Miracles are somewhat like enacted parables of the kingdom. Jesus had just gotten done preaching, he just gotten done teaching, and he demonstrates 
He demonstrates this important aspect of the kingdom. First, Jesus demonstrated God's power. In other words, the kingdom of God is now broken into human history. And second, Jesus saves his people through the storm. Now, the storm that came upon them suddenly uh, was common. This kind of storms are common on the Sea of Galilee. The lake sits on, in a basin, okay, 685 feet below sea level. There's 685 feet. That, okay, the lake is now 685 feet below sea level, surrounded by 2,000 feet high mountains. When the wind comes across those hills, they sweep down quickly with great force. In fact, the word that's used here in the Greek is the same word that we get the word hurricane from. Okay? That's how big and bad these storms are. Okay? It's the same root word. Okay? That we get the word hurricane from. This is a tremendously powerful storm. Jesus lays down to take a nap. The disciples were swamped. The words used here to indicate, now, now I, I think in your minds, if you think about this, guys, this is a, a little fishing boat, right? All right, you, you've got all the, the disciples of Jesus on, on this little fishing boat in a hurricane in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, okay? Now, in my mind, it says it's an ongoing dilemma. I don't know about you, but in my head, I can think to myself that they're taking anything and everything they can find, and they're trying to throw water out of the boat as quick as they can, Right? You know, I mean, I've seen, you know, these survival shows and stuff when they're, you know, a canoe and they have a hole in the canoe and they're trying to <laughs> get the water out of the boat. I can picture that in my head. This is a, it's an ongoing dilemma in hurricane force winds. And they're, they're shaken by it. Honestly, I think most of us would be. Right? So, I can picture in my head they're shoveling, shoveling out water out of the boat. Uh, they wake Jesus and they say, Master, Master, we're going to drown. The word master here means commander. Commander. Jesus, you are our commander. Now Luke 8.24 says, He, Jesus, got up and it says that he rebuked the wind and the raging waters and the storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and in amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? The disciples were afraid. But Jesus was not afraid at all. Now, when it says that Jesus used the words rebuke and be quiet, referring to the winds and the waves, these are the very same terms that Jesus used in casting out demons out of people. Rebuke and be quiet. Thus, there's a very strong connection between Jesus calming the storm and Jesus casting out demons out of people. In the next part of the chapter, uh, both so now they know both nature and demons know that they must both, na both nature and demons know that they must listen to and obey Jesus' authority. Jesus has demonstrated his power <coughs> over disease and over demons and over death before this, but this is the first time. That Jesus has shown his disciples his power over nature. Now for, for fishermen, this would have been very powerful, very, very important lesson, incredibly powerful lesson. It's not surprising that they had no faith in this particular miracle. This truly was extraordinary. The question changed because early they were asking the question of Jesus, what is this? Referring to his kingdom, well, this new teaching, what is this? But the question now changes. Who is this? Jesus' deeds reveal the truth. Jesus is the Son of God, revealed in human form. That was the first test in this passage. The second one is this. Now, I meant to share this earlier. The gospel can save souls. Right? No question, right? I and mean, if, if we listen with open heart, the gospel can save souls. The scriptures today and God's message to you potentially could also save your physical life as well. You're like, well, your soul's more important. Yes, that's true. But this, the, the word of God can also potentially save your physical life as well, if it's God's will. Now, so the next test is this, the test of Satan and his demons. For this next part, there are some things that we, for this next part, there are some things that we as a congregation must know. We need to know these things. We don't just come to church just for the fun of it. 
Right? I hope we don't, just for the fun of it. God is real. God is real. Yahweh, Father, God is real. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is real. The Word of God, the Bible, is the sword of the Spirit. That is real. The angels are real. Satan is real. And demons are real, too. I've studied this from Scripture and also from very conservative Christian sources. According to what I've studied, there are three ways that demons can enter people. Three ways. One, through deliberate, intentional, unrepented sins. Through people playing and dabbling in the occult. Ouija boards, tarot cards. And there have been cases where children have been affected also by an ancestor who was into evil things. The scriptures are clear. Stay away from sorcery and witchcraft. Have nothing to do with it. Why? Because God's real and the devil's real too. Have nothing to do with that stuff. Have nothing to do with sorcery and witchcraft. Now, there's a very real possibility here today. There's a very real possibility here today that if anyone has done any, any of the above or continues to do so, that evil has entered them and they are under control of the devil. It has happened on the mission field many times. I could share story after story of those in the mission field, but I also could share from personal experience of things that I have seen. America, too, is a mission field. This is not a game. This is not a game. This is real. <coughs> In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, he tells us this. Those of, those of us that are in Christ, finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Not our strength. We've tried to rely on ourselves alone and we'll fail every time. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against individuals. It's not against people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Heavenly realms. Therefore, now scriptures, you know, they, they mentioned in Bible college, if there's a therefore there, it means that the commands before it are extremely important, and that the next part we better listen to, because there's something that we all need to apply. Therefore, put on. The full armor of God, so that when, not if, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. And by the way, our vacation Bible school material is based directly on this passage. And guess what? The Lord directed it by the Holy Spirit over a year ago. Over a year ago to go through that. That's the Holy Spirit at work. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep praying for all the saints. Now, let's get back to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, we'll pick it back up in verse uh, 26. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus uh, stepped ashore... When, De when, Je when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from that town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes. He, lived in a, he had not lived in a house, but he had lived in tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at Jesus' feet, shouting at the top of his voice, 
What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirits to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and, he had, he had, and been driven by the demons into solitary places. This was very likely between 9 o'clock and midnight, 9 p.m. And, and midnight. This is uh, the land on the other side of Galilee in, the, in Gentile territory. Okay? This holds special importance to, the, to Luke as he outlines the gospel to the Gentiles. According to Mark Moore, there, uh, there's only one place on that side of the lake where the, where the, um, the land was high enough for the pigs to jump off into the water. Okay, So then we can pinpoint pretty much where this happened. Matthew records that there were two demon-possessed men. Okay, That's what Matthew says. But Luke only records the more vocal of the two. Now, notice that the demon, the demons, uh, the demon, the demon-possessed man meets Jesus. Know what happens. Notice what happens. He falls down at his feet and he clearly acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. Even demons know Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. He knows clearly that Jesus has complete power over him. Demons have faith. Demons have faith, but it's not a saving faith. They know for sure that Jesus is the Son of God. They know for sure that Jesus has authority over them. They know for sure that they're going to be judged and they're going to be tortured in the abyss. They know that. The abyss refers to the prison of evil beings. Now notice what our Lord Jesus asked him. He asked this man, what is your name? Now if you do not know about spiritual warfare... It is possible for more than one evil spirit, in fact, many evil spirits, to enter a person. Now, this is what is happening in this passage of Scripture. Notice how the demon responds to Jesus' question. Notice what he says uh, uh, to the question, what is your name? The demon says, Legion. Why is that significant? That's a lot. Yes. Military guys know that, right? Legion. Okay. Okay. So uh, many many demons had gone into him. Now, why this term legion is significant? Because legion in the, in the Roman army, a legion consisted of around six thousand soldiers. Six thousand soldiers, and his response was legion, for they were many. This man is in terrible spiritual shape. There are possibly thousands of demons in him. In fact, they're very likely thousands of demons in him. Now the demons have, have, they have Jesus greatly outnumbered. Yet Jesus is not worried. Jesus is not at all afraid. It is the demons that are absolutely petrified of the Lord Jesus. They know for certain Jesus has power to punish them. They are well aware of their impending judgment. These, de these demons are not asking to be delivered. They know that's not possible. They are asking to wreak havoc while they're here on earth, and they still do the same thing today. They, and they, the demons, begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding, verse 32. A large, a large herd of pigs was feeding there by the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, and they went, to the, went into the pigs. A herd then rushed down to the, rushed down the sleep bag and into the lake and drowned. Now pick up verse 35. The people came down to see what was happening. What had happened? When they came to Jesus, they found that the man whom the demons had gone out of, he was sitting at Jesus' feet. He was dressed and in his right mind. And they were very afraid. They were afraid. Jesus had just driven out many evil spirits out of the man who was causing all kinds of havoc in his vicinity. Destruction in his vicinity. And was supernaturally strong enough to break chains. This man had been spiritually set free. And so had that town been spiritually set free. You would think that the townspeople would have thanked Jesus. Jesus, thank you. You know, you think that would be the natural response for, 
protecting them from evil. Yet it says that they were afraid. And sadly, that town valued physical wealth over spiritual health. And they asked Jesus to leave. Verse 38. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told, uh, and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Jesus had spiritually driven out evil and spiritually healed this man. This man then obeys Jesus' commands, and he becomes a witness, a witness of what Jesus, the Son of God, had done for him. <coughs> the last point I want to share. These are some tips and advice for spiritual warfare. These things could potentially save your life. Save, it could also help save someone else's soul and their life. Stay in prayer. Stay in God's Word. Put on the full armor of God each day. Spiritual warfare is real. Don't fear evil. The evil one wants you to fear him. Don't fear him. Have a healthy fear of God. That's what Scripture commands. Also, don't go looking for a spiritual fight. The devil is supernatural. He's a supernatural being. If you toy with these things, you could end up being severely beaten, killed, or have your soul thrown into hell. If you look at how acts happened, they were toying with these things, and they took a severe beating, those that were toying with these things. Now, all of that being said, if you're a true disciple in, Je if you're a true disciple in Jesus, and at times when you're in spiritual leadership, sometimes spirit you don't go looking for battles, but spiritual battles will come to you. It's just part of being who God wants you to be. And sometimes it's going to happen. Just like it did to Jesus. It happened to Jesus... It, it'll, it'll happen to us at times. The scriptures are true. The scriptures are true. If it's in the scripture, it's real. Fear God, not evil. Put on the armor of God. Live by the Holy Spirit. Walk as close to God as you possibly can. Now, remember, biblically, remember biblically, there are at least four things that will help you, that will help you as a faithful disciple of Jesus in spiritual warfare. Remember these. These are, these are very important. Very important. There are at least four things that can help you as a faithful disciple of Jesus in spiritual warfare. One is the name of Jesus. You know, in hymns, we sing about the name of Jesus all the time, right? Or in, in courses, the name of Jesus. We sing about, about Jesus' name often. Jesus' name is above every name. Philippians 2.9 says that, that Jesus' name is above every name. And you just saw the power uh, that Jesus had over the situation. Call upon Jesus. If you end up in a spiritual fight, there is great power in the name of Jesus. Two, the blood of Jesus. It sets the believing, repentant person free. There is great power in the blood of Jesus. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says this. They, they referring to the faithful disciples in Christ, they conquered Satan, how? By the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. The name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The third one is this. The word of God. It's called the sword of the spirit for a reason. It's the sword of the spirit. In Ephesians. Um, and, and it's called the sword of the spirit for many reasons. When, when the word of God is preached or taught or swung and followed. The kingdom of God moves forward. And the kingdom of darkness is eventually driven back and driven out. The word of God is the third one. Last one. Prayer offered in faith. Prayer offered in faith. Now notice I didn't just say prayer. Because if you're just praying and you don't believe what you're praying, that's not going to be any good. You have to be believing in the one you're praying to, which is Yahweh, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit. You pray to God in faith. Believing. Okay? Believing. James 5, 15 and 16. Remember... It mentions, it mentions this uh, there. Okay? Remember, this is not just prayer. This is prayer offered in faith. You must be believing what you're praying. And the scripture also clearly teaches that the faithful prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I can remember when I was younger. I can remember when I was younger and I was going through a tough time or a tough trial. And I would call my grandparents. 
because I knew they were faithful. And I knew if I asked him to pray for me, I can just tell the truth. I, I, mean, I was going through different, you know, trials and storms of life, you know, young kid out of high school, into college, and after college, and ministry, and all these different things. And I called and asked him to pray. I can tell you, burdens were lifted, trials were not as tough, God gave me strength, God showed me the way. I learned from that. Always have faithful people pray for you. Good things come from that, and that's what Scripture says. This morning, if you this morning, this morning you have seen Jesus, the Son of God, by his power over nature. You have seen Jesus, the Son of God, by his power to drive out evil spirits. In Jesus' name, believe in Jesus. This stuff's not a game. We don't meet just for the fun of it. Eternity is at stake. People's lives, people's souls are at stake. In Jesus' name, believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Have your sins washed away. Be baptized. Re receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Give your life to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. And let him watch over you and protect you and your family. This morning, if you have a decision to make for Jesus Christ, please come forward as we sing our invitation.
much for being here today. God loves you. We love you. Um, stay in prayer. Uh, stay in God's word. I'm going to ask Matt if you'll have a closing prayer for us. Father in heaven, we believe in you. You are real. You are the reason why we are here. The reason why we come back. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for Jesus. You are strong. We are weak. We get our strength through Christ. His burden is light. God loves you. We love you. Have a great week, y'all. God bless.